I invite your attention to that opening book of the Bible, the book of Genesis, into chapter 16. We continue our journey in the study of the life of Abram, Abraham, and as we noted in our intro to this morning's sermon uh, service, uh, this is a mighty, messy chapter, and so uh, we'll look to the Lord's uh, Spirit to help us, and let's bow and ask for His help. Our Heavenly Father, may this Your Word be our rule, uh, Your Spirit our teacher, and Your greater glory our supreme concern. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, Amen. Amen. Genesis chapter 16, oh, we'll, read, we'll read the chapter in its entirety. Now Sarai, Abram's wife, had borne him no children. She had a female Egyptian servant whose name was Hagar. And Sarai said to Abram, Behold now, the Lord has prevented me from bearing children. Go into my servant. It may be that I shall obtain children by her. And Abram listened to the voice of Sarai. So after Abram had lived ten years in the land of Canaan, Sarai, Abram's wife, took Hagar the Egyptian, her servant, and gave her to Abram, her husband, as a wife. And he went into Hagar, and she conceived. And when she saw that she had conceived, she looked with contempt on her mistress. Sarah said to Abram, May the wrong done to me be on you. I gave my servant to your embrace, and when she saw that she had conceived, she looked on me with contempt. May the Lord judge between you and me. But Abram said to Sarai, Behold, your servant is in your power. Do to her as you please. Then Sarai dealt harshly with her, and she fled from her. The angel of the Lord found her by a spring of water in the wilderness, the spring on the way to Shur. And he said, Hagar, servant of Sarai, where have you come from and where are you going? She said, I am fleeing from my mistress Sarai. And the angel of the Lord said to her, return to your mistress and submit to her. The angel of the Lord also said to her, I will surely multiply your offspring so that they cannot be numbered for multitude. And the angel of the Lord said to her, Behold, you are pregnant and you shall bear a son. You shall call his name Ishmael because the Lord has listened to your affliction. He shall be a wild donkey of a man, his hand against everyone, and everyone's hand against him. And he shall dwell over against all his kinsmen. So she called the name of the Lord who spoke to her, You are a God of seeing. For she said, Truly, here, have I, here I have seen him who looks after me. Therefore the well was called Beer le Hairoi. It lies between Kadesh and Barad. And Hagar bore Abram a son. And Abram called the name of his son whom Hagar bore Ishmael. Abram was 86 years old when Hagar bore Ishmael to Abraham. So ends the reading of God's holy word. Uh, may we hear it by his spirit. Uh, when, when I think of shortcuts, I, I often think back to high school to a thing called Cliff's Notes. Now, I may or may not have used a few of those across the years, but if you didn't want to read what um, uh, that, that long, complicated novel the teacher assigned, you could go and purchase this pamphlet called a Cliff's Note. And it would give you a handy summary of each character uh, who is spelled out, and uh, the basic plot line would be there. And if you had learned those elements in that Cliff's Note, you probably could get a C or so on that particular test and make it through the class okay. Well, uh, there are all sorts of uh, shortcuts available today, but we want to note that we, we need to be cautious about shortcuts. 
Uh, today, we're continuing to explore the faith development of God's key man, Abram. And we're looking at him in yet another deep valley of failure. He's been doing really quite well the last couple of chapters after his initial failure in Egypt. But now, Abram and his wife venture into a spiritual blunder that to our 21st century eyes seems so blatantly wrong and immoral that we might pause to ask ourselves, how could these people do these things and be followers of God? When I ask those sorts of questions of biblical people, I, I have to pause. I have to stop and wonder about my own life and the things that I do that are surely wrong in others' eyes, and yet I can't see myself with an objective eye in the cold light of day. In other words, it's always easy to find fault with other followers of God and what they do and excuse yourself from similar or like kinds of sins. This spiritual failure comes on the heel of success. Abram's been riding the crest of a wave. In fact, after chapter 15, we would have thought his faith would certainly have been strong enough to have sailed for quite a while. And yet Paul reminds us himself in the text that Chad read for us from 1 Corinthians 10 that if you think you are standing firm, beware. That is the time you would fall away. And what we have here in Genesis 16 is a classic situation of trying to solve a spiritual problem with a shortcut of human devices and wisdom rather than a patient trust in the plan of God Himself. And in the opening words of this chapter, a problem is presented to us, a real problem. Now Sarai, Abram's wife, had borne him no children. The whole covenant of God was keynoted on the fact that Abram would have a son, a biological son. God had made that very clear to him, but Abram, who was now some 85 plus years old, uh, did not have that son. And nowhere in sight did he appear. And Sarai was thinking about that, and, and she herself was about a decade younger than Abram. She was somewhat in her 70s, and she began to form the conclusion based probably on her age that, that maybe the son uh, could be Abram's but wasn't going to be mine. Now, God's whole predicted covenant of a vast nation for Abram and his people all hinged on this son, and that promise seemed to be in jeopardy. And so these two people, and, and in one sense, I mean, we could praise them. I mean, they were godly. And they wanted to see God's covenant fulfilled and Surely they just thought, maybe God needs our help. It doesn't seem to be happening by natural means here. Maybe we need to come up with something that involves what we might call thinking outside the box. But what we learn here is a very simple but powerful lesson. That God's ends never justify just any old means of attaining them. God's ends never justify any old means of attaining them. 
And we see that this chapter witnesses the two powerful aspects for us. And the first aspect in the opening six verses is out of the folly, the foolishness of human expediency of shortcuts as a way to God's goal. The foolishness of our scheming as a way to reaching God's Goals. And so we're introduced to this mess of a marriage triangle with Abram, Sarai, and Hagar. And I must remind you as we began to think about this, where Hagar comes from in this picture. If you look at those opening verses, Hagar was a female Egyptian servant. That term Egyptian is a strong clue that trouble is on the horizon. She's from Egypt. And when was the last time they were in Egypt? Well, you recall it was back when Abraham had such a terrible failure in his life. And so now this Egyptian comes to play yet another key role in a failure in Abram's life. And yet it it seems to me, even as Americans in this 21st century, when we look back on this, even with all the sexual immorality of our society today, we're actually shocked at what happens here. I mean, if, if you knew anybody who actually did this, you wouldn't know how to talk about it. I mean, someone brought in a, a servant or a laborer and said, look, we haven't been able to have a child. Um, can you help us out here by, by sleeping with my husband? You would say, gross, terrible, stunning, immoral. Uh, but, the, but the amazing thing is that this was something that was actually socially acceptable and even entirely legal in the ancient Near Eastern world. We've learned some things about the legal documents and the way legal proceedings went on in that day when some documents from King Hammurabi uh, was uncovered some years back. Uh, They discovered a whole series of laws and principles and things clearly articulated and spelled out, whereas in the Bible we only have Ten Commandments and King Hammurabi, well, there's over 300-something laws all spelled out. And some of those laws that were passed down from different cultures to different cultures included that of being able to bring a concubine in and have that as an additional wife to provide a son because sons were so important for the uh, inheritance of the family. And so this wasn't entirely legal and socially acceptable practice. So we have this plot that begins as a piece of folly proposed by Sarai, who has been the silent partner. All we know about her is she's been the silent partner thus far in Abram's escapades, and she is tremendously beautiful. And you know, as you, as you think about this, you, you, you do have to give Sarai some, some benefit of doubt, some credit here. I mean, if selfishness was her motive, she would never have done this thing. You have to at least sense that she wanted to honor her husband. She wanted to honor the promise of God And so in order to put away her her own pride and her own sense of being the exclusive wife and, and to say, I'll step aside and I'll recommend this idea if it will make happen the things that God said were going to happen. So in a backhanded kind of sense, 
I mean, it, it does credit her in some way. Uh, perhaps she was thinking, you know, God said, Abram must have a son. And she talked with him about that, obviously. And, and God had said Abram was to have a son. And perhaps she began to rationalize as the years went by. Well, God said Abram was to have a son, but, but nowhere did he say, I was going to have that son. And so, and the text hadn't at this point. And so she worked through that. And she developed this plot. It sounds very plausible for her to do that. And as a kind of an aside, just very briefly, uh, this is one of those sticking points, by the way, that people often raise up the immorality of the Old Testament patriarchs. I don't know if you've ever been confronted with this question when as friends, you're talking with them about the gospel and all that. So how can you follow this God who, who condones? I mean, all those patriarchs had, had, had multiple wives. They practiced polyg polygamy. In fact, uh, the Mormon group uh, across the years has argued for that to be practiced because of the way we would see it throughout the Old Testament. And they would say, listen, all the patriarchs practice that. It must be God's plan, right? Wrong. No. There are a lot of things done in the Bible by godly people that does not have God's stamp of approval on them. And polygamy, multiple wives, is one. Yes, these people lived in a day and time when society did sanction this. And yet, even then, the Lord had already given His firm pattern on what Scripture has to say about marriage and intimate behavior between a man and a woman, what it was to be like. And he said that way back in Genesis chapter 2, right at the very beginning, right after he created man and woman. He said that man and woman are to give themselves together and an exclusive and monogamous relationship only between them and they were to exclude anyone else in that arrangement. He set that out plainly and clearly in the Garden of Eden. It's not a mere accident. We have it there before the fall. It's right at the very beginning, right where God shows us and tells us the ideal. And when people stepped apart that from that throughout the Old Testament, I, I know probably what some of us think is that, well, surely when, when some of those patriarchs did that, God would have thundered a little bit at them and rattled their cages a little bit and, and get their attention and say, you naughty guys, you've disobeyed me in the area of taking another wife, and so I'm going to get you for that. But, but, but the Old Testament never shows us that. And the Lord never says that. However, every single example you see in Scripture where anyone did step apart from God's model of one man and one woman, the negative consequences and the disaster and the chaos that affected the families for generations upon generations, for multiple generations, were a clear sign that God's hand of favor had been pulled from them in these particular areas. You can always judge what is God's will and what isn't by whether the, it produces sweet fruit or sour fruit that would set the family's teeth on edge. And in the Old Testament, polygamy, multiple marriages always, always, always produced negative 
results. And that's how we gather and gain the sense that, yes, God's hand uh, was against that. Well, Sarah, in some ways, uh, is surely a woman we would want to pity in some respects. Yes, yes. She does propose something here that does not have prayer about it. It doesn't have the leading of God about it. And it was wrong. She was wrong. And yet, when we think of her and her plight, and we think in the church today even, I'm not so sure that we, we don't carefully think about the bitter thought life and self-worth of a woman who, who's unable to bear children. It's so hurtful for so many. And, and I, I think we may want to pause and think more carefully about people who are in that situation. Uh, Sarai probably sensed pressure, felt and bore, bore a great sense of guilt because she wasn't able to bear this child to Abram in order to see God's promise being fulfilled. In fact, at verse 2, we get a sense that she may have been thinking along those lines when she uses that term, that phrase, the Lord himself has prevented me. He's kept me from bearing. So quite probably she's wrestling uh, with those issues of false guilt and things of that nature. And so probably she, she came to that place, she said, maybe I just need to step aside and let God do this another way. But then the problem deepens as... Uh, at, at this folly as Abram himself accepts her proposal and cooperates with her. Now folks, he, he may seem like a passive partner here, but he is the one at blame. In the same way, the entire Bible looks to the Garden of Eden and tells us it was Adam who sinned. Yes, yes, it was the woman who proposed something to him. But Scripture looks at the man who is the moral and spiritual leader of the relationship and puts the blame on him for doing this. Husbands, listen carefully. If you think we can stand before the Lord one day or will stand before the Lord one day and say, I couldn't help, it was all my wife's ideas and it might have been. Well, friend, that's not going to fly. As hard as it is, as painful as it is, as difficult as it can be in wives, you can make it mighty hard on your husbands. But men, listen. That's what spiritual leadership is about. You are the one who is called to lead your homes in the Lord. And that's why Abram is to blame here. And he just simply Cops out. We can't blame Hagar in one sense, can we? I mean, after all, she's a servant girl. And yet she does bear a little blame. For as soon as she discovered she was pregnant, she immediately began to start this, started this pride game and mocked Sarai who had given so much up, and Sarai couldn't deal with this. She simply went ballistic. And I'm reminded here uh, of a place in the book of Proverbs in chapter 30 at verse 21 and through 23 that says, there are three things that makes the earth tremble. And I'm not going to go through two of them, but the third one was a maidservant that displaces her mistress. 
And friend, I want you to know, underneath the tent of Abram and Sarai, the earth was trembling. But not only does this passage witness the foolishness of human scheming and plotting, but we see the wonderful mercy of God, which is certainly more, aren't you thankful? But the wonderful mercy of God in the midst of our marital messes. Verse 7 and following, we see a special visitor. Hagar, in fact, enters center stage at this point, and she experiences this unexpected visitor and this unanticipated uh, blessing. Uh, there's a mess here, a terrible mess. And Hagar couldn't handle the pressure anymore. And she does what many of us do when homes get messy, when life gets hard. Many of us just want to take flight and run. And that's what Hagar did. I'm out of here. I'm checking out. Isn't that what we often do much of the time? We haven't been able to work out the tense relationships going on in our home or in some other vital relationship. And the easiest thing to do is simply to check out and say, I'm gone. I'm just not going to deal with this anymore. I'm not going to put up with this anymore. And that's what Hagar did. She made a great discovery, though. Along the way, she met a person, a special person called the angel of the Lord. Now, this is the first time this person shows up in the Bible. He does appear a number of different times later on. And she receives a message for herself as a disadvantaged victim that God is ready to restore. He sees her circumstance. He, he, he sees what she's going through. And he's ready to restore. He's ready to forgive. He finds her at a spring in the desert. And a place where you would expect to find physical refreshment to happen. And it's there that she met this special person called the angel of the Lord. Now, this person is a person of great discussion among theologians and commentators. And the reason why is because in the Bible, when people meet this person, that, that immediately they don't recognize who this person is, but uh, along the conversation, at some point, they come to a place and they began to think, this is God. They draw the conclusion that this one they're talking to or just spoke to, this angel of the Lord, is God. And so many theologians understand that the angel of the Lord is a pre-incarnate appearance of Jesus Christ. And that may well be. We, we would be humble to exercise caution and recognize that, that it doesn't say that specifically, though we may draw that conclusion. But certainly we do understand this, this uh, angel of the Lord is, is clearly a mysterious person, and he's certainly revealing truth from God, and it seems to be a person of divine origin. And here, is like he does every other time. He, he comes with a special message and he gives divine communication that God sees you and God desires to bless you. Uh, Hagar uh, gave, gave this special person a name, this one whom she said was the Lord. She says, you are the God who sees me. And she marveled over him. You, you saw me, little old me. I, I, she was just a nobody, folks. She was a mere servant girl. And the Lord saw her. Yes, she served in the camp of Abram. 
And she had certainly overheard him talking about the God Most High, and she had seen the altars that were erected, but she had no in-depth knowledge of this God. And so now this God comes to her with a revelation. She is assured that this child is, is going to be born and even what his name will be and what he'll be like. He is a man, we're told, who is going to be like a wild donkey. One commentator aptly said, Ishmael is one with a permanent chip on his shoulder with his finger on a hair trigger. And that's exactly what life was like for him. Everyone was his enemy, and he was everyone's enemy. Now today we know that Ishmael was the father of the Arab nations, and he would be the constant opponents and the violent adversaries of Abraham through Isaac from time immemorial, even to this very day. And what we began to gain a sense of is this foolish plot, this human scheming, this sinful act has brought ill effects that have been long, long, long reaching. This mother of Ishmael, even in spite of that, is told she could have a blessing. The angel said, you only need to do one simple thing. Go back. Go back and submit yourself to your mistress. In fact, you actually sinned. It was wrong of you to flaunt your pride against Sarai. So go back and tell her you're sorry. The God who saw Hagar was ready to give a blessing, ready to give a new start to this person. So, so what can we take home from this story? It's a mess. And we still see the effects of it this day. And that's part of what we know in our own lives. That's the danger of sin. Is that it, it may seem pleasurable at the moment. It may even seem like you're getting away with it. And it may even be unknown for years and years and years. I've ever known. But friend, listen. Sin always costs more than you're willing to pay. It'll keep you longer than you're willing to stay, always. Sin will, re, will, will find its way out. And it may be in relationships, it may be in your children, it may be in your grandchildren down through the ages, you see it played out. And that's what we see here. But what can, we, what can we learn from this? Well, there are a number of things. Let me just quickly go over a couple. And of course, initially in pursuing any revealed goal from God, no matter what it may be, the end never justifies the means. In other words, you can't justify trying to achieve a holy purpose by an unholy method. You cannot justify a good end to enable you to do unholy things along the way. That good end will be met in God's good way. So just note that we cannot do that. Paul reminds us of that, for instance, in the book of Galatians chapter 3. Centuries later, he wrote, You foolish Galatians, after beginning so well with the Spirit, why are you now trying to attain your goal through human effort alone? Let me just unpack this just quickly. One way we see this, for instance, is in that of leading churches. 
that of planting churches. And, and, and we have a passion to see that happen. We're, we're a church plant. Now, now, part of the risk and part of the danger of being a church planter is, you know, you got to get a certain number of people and you got to get a certain budget in order to make it viable so you can live and so you can have a job. And so, and how do you do that? Well, marketing tells you how to do that. You tell people what they want to hear. You make people feel good about themselves. You don't tell them things that they don't like. And you get them there by uh, what they call meeting their felt needs. And you can do that and you can draw a crowd. You can get rather large crowds doing that. But friend, unless the Lord builds the house, it will not accomplish God's ends. And so we see that not only in that kind of work, but even in our own personal lives. But let me just close with this warning. It's a warning today, a stark warning uh, for seeing the human relationship between a man and a woman called marriage. Once again, God has established the pattern way back in the book of Genesis. Early on in chapter 2, monogamous... Marriage between man and woman, between one man and one woman, is God's way of satisfaction for the joy and delight of human sexuality and producing children. Every side road or every shortcut that tries to skirt around that or to give it another name or to follow another procedure is a departure from God's way and is not under the favor of God. Now you all know that our society is desperately trying to redefine marriage today. Man and man, woman and woman. Why not call this marriage, they say, they love each other. You don't want to be mean to them, do you? Uh, we accept them just as they are. And, and so we think this is the way it should be. And that's what our society is telling us. And some 68% plus in our society today tells us these things are acceptable. I'm fine with it, they say. But God's not fine with it. It's not God's ideal. It's not God's way of creating a family. And God cannot smile on that which shortcuts His way. And surely another way of shortcutting God's way is the widespread practice today of living together apart from marriage. God is in favor of marriage. A man and a woman who have publicly committed themselves totally one to the other. And I know these things may seem to be legalized by a, a broad a social approval. After all, everybody's doing it. But friend, God's Word tells us there's one way, one model, one proven path to His way and His happiness of a man and a woman. And Genesis 2 teaches us that. It's marriage between one man and one woman. Believers who, who opt for more uh, societal approval in their sexual unions are going to pay a cost. It's a long-term cost, perhaps. Again, maybe in generations ahead of them. But listen, God is faithful. Uh, this book is not a book of condemnation. The whole last half of chapter 16 is about blessing. God sees the one who was the victim in all of this. And he heard her. He sees her. He approached her with blessing. And he says, now, you aren't without responsibility. I want you to go back and admit where you are wrong. Make an open confession and you can have a new life. And friend, that's true for us all. So if there is that sin in your life, go back. 
make an open confession, repent of it, and you can experience the hand of God's blessing again. The God of Hagar is the God who sees you and me. He sees all the messes in our past, and He is the God who forgives. You may have an Ishmael rattling around in your closet somewhere. And I have to tell you, those scars don't go away automatically when you confess your faith or when you come to the Lord. But the God who sees you is the God of compassion and He's the God of a new beginning. That's why we have that reflection in 2 Chronicles 16, that the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to show His might on behalf of those whose heart is blameless toward Him. The God who sees is the God who forgives. He's the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who himself was faithful to his bride when she walked out on him. And he'll be faithful to you when you look to him. Let's pray. Our God and Father, may we be found to be faithful. And when we are faithless, may we be quick to repentance and confession. And Lord, we ask your favor, your blessings upon our families. Strengthen their homes. Fill them with your spirit. Give them hearts that are blameless to you, hearts that desire to, to walk with you. And when they fall on their face, scramble them with your spirit to draw up to their knees and cry out, O oh Lord, have mercy on me. This we pray in Christ's name. Amen.